Uh, welcome to Five on Friday. I am coming to you a bit earlier today, which I know won't suit probably everybody, but it was either this or not do it at all. Um, I'm off to the Gold Coast later this afternoon to launch um, the new Tristan Banks book, which is this one here, Detention. This is an ARC, an advanced reading copy of it. Um, I'm really excited about going to launch this book. I love everything Tristan Banks uh, writes and this one is just spectacular. So yes, apologies for those for whom this time does not work, but if you're watching this later, still leave me a comment and tell me what you've been reading this week. Um, I'm also not feeling particularly well today. I've had a really, really, really busy week and I um, woke up this morning feeling just not 100% well, so I'm clutching my tissue. I should put that down. That's a bit gross. Um, yeah, I'm not feeling 100%, but that could also have something to do with the fact that I had an event last night at work, which was a really, really lovely event with children's author and psychologist Karen Young. Um, she was talking about anxiety in children and teens. It was a great event, uh, but for dinner I ate um, several really, like I'd say, hunks of camembert with um, fresh honeycomb on the top. That was that was sort of that was dinner. Um, then I went to bed, um, and then I got up this morning and I didn't have any food in the house, but I did have these really nice kind of puff pastry pear and walnut things I'd made the other night when I needed something sweet. They looked a bit sad, so I stuck them in the air fryer and they were really, really, really good. Um, yeah, they just kind of went caramelized and crispy. So that was breakfast. I ate basically pear, walnuts, butter and pastry for breakfast. And then after a spot of um, grief counseling with one of my girls, um, for one of the girls, I, uh, ate a Cinnabon with a cup of coffee and then I ate a, um, a block of chocolate that a parent ha um, from work left on my desk but it's Manuka honey bee pollen and puffed amaranth chocolate and I think that's pretty healthy so I, I don't know I, I'm okay with that so it did just occur to me that all I've eaten all day is basically butter and sugar and chocolate um, so that could also be why I don't feel very well. So I hope I don't vomit on Tristan Banks in the launch of his book because that would be horrific. Um, so yes, I'm off to launch the new Tristan Banks book at the Gold Coast tonight and I'm also going to Romancing the Stars which is a um, book links and Somerset Story Fest collaboration where you speed date authors. Um, my hands are sweating. Actually, as I talk about it, I actually can't think of anything worse than being um, speed dated by other authors and children's literature people, but I'm sure it will be great. The book launch is going to be fab. Um, anyway, on to the books that I'm talking about this week. Oh my goodness. Can you tell I'm getting sick? This is just ridiculous. Also need to take Panadol. Take Panadol, Megan. All right. First book I want to talk to you about today is Do Not Lick This Book. Now, this one was shortlisted last year in the Children's Book Council Book Week Awards. The reason that I'm talking about it now is that um, it, you know, all of the book council shortlisted books go out of, uh, you can't get them. You can't get them or they're super expensive um, in that year. So I wanted to talk about this one now and remind you all of it because it's now back in stock. You can buy it and it's absolutely fantastic. Alison Tate, I am totally like the pastry version of The Very Hungry Caterpillar. I am totally like that. I love that. I am the pastry version of The Hungry Caterpillar. There is a book in that. Um, anyway, back to Do Not Lick This Book, which I shouldn't do given all I've eaten all day is sugar and butter. This is brilliant. I, When this book came out and then was subsequently shortlisted, I just was so pleased because it utterly deserves every award and congratulations it receives. It's brilliant. It's about um, microscopic um, beings and microbes and it starts this is Min. Min is a microbe. She's small, very small. Can you see this dot? Microbes are so small that a big number of those can fit on this dot and so it goes on. And then what they've done is they very cleverly used microscopic images, actual real ones, to show you that um, what different things look like. So this one is, oh this one, in this one Min lives in this book. And then this is a microscopic image of the pages of a book and you can see Min is there and she says, I'm here. So then the reader is asked to um, 
take men on an adventure so you touch the book and this is my actual copy of the book from my school library but I don't actually get the kindergarten children to um, touch the book because then there would be microbes all over my own book so I uh, just say you know put your finger up there and touch men and you put her on your finger away we go and you then you go on an adventure to teeth this is my favorite page and you then touch your teeth and you put men on your teeth and then this is a microscopic image of teeth and it is brilliant. And on here, they meet um, they meet um, other microbes. And the microbes are saying things like, yuck, can you smell toothpaste? Hey, kid, brush your teeth less and eat more lollies. It's just so clever. And then she's obviously picked up a microbe friend. And then they go on adventure to a shirt. This is a shirt where they pick up more microbes. Dennis, who's a little bit, uh, he's not the cleverest germ in the package. And then you go into a belly button where they eat chunks of sweat and dead skin. It's so gross, but just so good. So good. And then there's all these microbes on your little finger. And then you're asked to put them back into the book. It's just so clever. It's written for an early childhood audience, but I think this one's got applications all through the primary school years. I absolutely love it. It's such a great way to ex explain microbes and... I, it's just, it's utterly clever, it's utterly, oh, it's giftable, it's the whole package. I really, really like it. So I just wanted to remind you of that one because it was shortlisted last year and nobody could buy it anywhere and you now can buy it everywhere. All right, this is another oldie but a goodie. This one is beautiful. It's called Courage and it's by Bernard Warbur. Now this book was actually given to me by a very dear friend of mine who is also a widow and she um, gave this one to me when Dan passed away. And she said it was one of her, I'm not going to read her inscription, but it says that it was one of her absolute favourite books um, when she was recently widowed and that she hopes hoped that it would give courage to the girls and I. Um, so, of course, that inscription made me cry. Um, but it is just such a beautiful book. It starts by saying there are many kinds of courage. Awesome kinds, acrobats, and everyday kinds. Still, courage is courage, whatever kind. Courage is riding your bicycle for the first time without training wheels. Courage is a spelling bee and your word is superliciousness. Courage is mealtime and so it goes on. It just gives kind of ordinary, kind of odd, kind of whimsical examples of courage. Some of them are small acts of courage, some of them are silly and some of them are, you know, a bit sad. It's It's... There is, it doesn't really talk, it's not a book about loss and grief, but it's a book about courage and being brave through all of life's um, ups and downs, the small downs and the very, very big downs. It's just a really clever book. I, interestingly, I read um, on Goodreads a while ago some criticism of this book that said, oh, some of the acts of courage weren't really very courageous. They were... Um, a bit silly and they weren't really you know somebody didn't have to be brave in those acts and I found that a strange criticism because courage is courage um, you know everybody is scared of different things and needs to be courageous in different situations what we might think of as not at all courageous for somebody else might be an extreme act of bravery so um, I did read that criticism of this book, but to me that's one of the most appealing things about this book, that it's looking at small acts of courage and really large acts of courage. I just think it's a really good way to look at courage and start discussions about courage, either in classrooms or in your homes. Um, and it's about, you know, it's just one of those books that's very sort of um, affirming. It gives you that idea um, that we're all walking on this journey together and it, it takes all sorts and it takes all types of courage and kindness and compassion and empathy for the world to be the wonderful place that it is. So highly recommend this one um, for any situation. Obviously this was given to me in a time when I needed a lot of courage and bravery but I think this is one of those books that would be you know just a great book to have at home and a definitely a great one to have in your school library for some of those big conversations right the next three books because i'm not feeling that great and i am the pastry version of the hungry caterpillar i've left the other three books at school so anyway i'm just going to talk to you about them um the next one i want to talk to you about is Coraline, which 
obviously it came out donkey's years ago. I think it came out, I did write it down somewhere. It came out in like, yeah, 2002. So it's been out forever. It's written by Neil Gaiman. It's a super short chapter book. Um, and I, I stumbled across it on audio the other day when we were going on a long drive, two hour drive. And I thought, oh, I'm going to stick Coraline on. My memory of it was um, that it um, was published to rave reviews. It, it won an absolute slew of awards all over the world. And um, it, and it is wonderful. And I remember it as very sort of Alice in Wonderland going down the rabbit hole. And it was mysterious and a tiny bit spooky, but it was basically sort of fairy tale-ish. So I um, had my seven and 11 year old in the car and I stuck on Coraline. Um, look, um, it is great, but it was a little spooky. So basically the premise is that Coraline moves into a new home and she's got these really, they're very nice parents, perfectly nice, but they're a bit removed. Coraline's an only child and really they leave Coraline to her own devices. So they um, encourage her to safely go and explore her new home and she discovers a door which is locked um, and her mother then gives her the key and says, oh, you know, it's not locked for any particular reason. It's just you know, in going into the next flat. And she opens this door and she enters the flat, which is unoccupied, and she um, finds out that behind this locked door is a flat which looks quite eerily similar to her own flat. And in this flat is a person who looks very much like her mother. Um, and then this person turns around and this person has um, got doesn't have eyes. Instead, they have black but large black buttons which are, are sewn over the eyes and this other person says hello Coraline I'm your other mother and at that point when we were driving to Noosa listening to the audiobook I thought oh that's right this book's really scary um but anyway by that stage my children were very um engaged and I said oh, girls, maybe we should listen to something else and my youngest said, no, no, I like scary stories. So we listened on. Um, and look, as I said, I've read Coraline before. And it's utterly, it's age appropriate. In a sense, it's almost, I don't know, I was going to say it's a horror story for children. Is that even a thing? It's a mysterious, spooky story. It's a little bit supernatural. There is no violence. There is no blood and gore. I think it takes children right to the edge of super scary possibly kind of horror movie stuff but then it does pull back um but it possibly wasn't appropriate for my seven year old anyway look that was a week ago and she hasn't had nightmares so i i don't think i've scarred her for life um i just love it i remembered listening to it in audio what i first loved about it and that story is just so in my head now so this other mother in this other flat um is basically wanting Coraline's soul and Coraline decides that she is, that other mother is not having her soul. And she also finds other children who've been captured by the other mother. Um, and she wants to rescue their souls. And her parents have also been captured by the other mother. Um, and she wants to rescue her parents. So it's basically this amazing, mysterious, spooky, creepy adventure. Coraline has a black cat that sort of assists her. Uh, the story is told from Coraline's perspective but it's an adult narrator and I think that that allows Coraline to um, have a fairly mature outlook on what's happening to her. It is kind of scary but it's an absolute modern classic and there is a movie of it. The movie was made in about 2009. The movie is quite different to the book. Um, I didn't really like the movie. Um, it also got rave reviews. It's just very different to the book. I think the book is much tighter. As I said, it's a very slim book. It's just, it's a brilliant story. So highly recommend the book. Maybe not for seven year olds, you know, no need to terrify children. But as I said, it's not violent or gory. And Neil Gaiman, I mean, the man is just a master of visuals and of text. So it is highly recommended. Okay, next book I was going to talk about Similarly, I have left the book at school, but we did listen to this one on audio as well. I have also read this whole series in paperback. It's Percy Jackson and the Olympiads. Olympics? Olympiads? Olympiads, I think. The first one is The Lightning Thief, and that's the one that I just listened to last week. Um, it was, again, published ages ago, published in 2005. It's an American fantasy adventure 
um, based on the idea of demigods, which are um, children who were born of a mortal parent and a god, and a Greek god. There's a lot of Greek mythology in it. And in fact, the thing I love the most about this book is that um, Rick Riordan, the author, was, I think he was a teacher or an academic of Greek mythology some time ago before he was writing. And the way these books came about was that his son was diagnosed with ADHD and dyslexia and ADHD and dyslexia often go hand in hand. And his son really struggled with reading and he... Um, really struggled at school. Um, now, I have fairly strong views on this. I think the school system often does fail um, those kids who don't fit the norm, particularly those with ADHD and things like ADHD and dyslexia. And um, they do often, they're often the kids that, um, not always, but do struggle with reading. Um, I've written a chapter in my book about reading differences because actually I've got a lot of dyslexic kids that I have taught over the years that are amazing uh, readers and accesses of story, whether they access that in audio form or graphic novel form. I kind of, I've taught over my 20 years as a teacher some amazing um, dyslexic um readers and writers and I absolutely adore them and what I love about this series is that I also believe that kids with dyslexia and ADHD have other superpowers and that is what this book is about. It's about these kids who don't fit the norm um, and, and they're demigods so they're half human and half um, Greek god and they are, they all end up on a bus in a, on the, their way to a summer camp. As it turns out it's a summer camp called Camp Half-Blood, which is a camp for demigod children. Um, and in the first book, there's this war about to start between Greek gods and these young demigods need to um, sort that situation out. So there's quite a few books in the series. They've also been made into movies. Again, I'm going to say I don't think that the movies are as good as the books in this case, and that's not always the case. Sometimes the movies are better than the books, but in this case, I don't think they are. I just love these books for the whole superpower thing, for the whole looking at kids who read differently thing um, and access school and school curriculum differently. I, I just love them. They're absolute page turners. They're great for reluctant readers, but they're also great for really prolific readers who love fantasy. Um, and they've just got this lovely sense of diversity and inclusiveness and there's heaps and heaps of Greek mythology. Just adore them. Really, really like them. And then my next book, which I'm going to talk about, is the one that we've just been reading for my Girls' Own Book Club, which is my Year 6 book club. Um, and we talked about it this week. We have read The Girl, the Dog and the Rider in Rome, and now a lot of the girls are going on to read The Girl, the Dog and the Rider in Provence. And in September, the final instalment in this trilogy by Katrina, I think it's Namesteed, it's Namesteed, I actually don't know, um, will come out. And it is The Girl, the Dog and the Writer in Lucerne. And they are just the most beautiful, beautiful series. They're perfect for readers in about grade five, six, seven. And as I said, we've done it for our year six book club. Uh, just this term and it was really enjoyed by the girls and also by the mums, aunts and grandmothers that read with us. It is about a little girl called Freya and her mother is a um, person who studies animals. I'm having a mental blank because I've eaten too much chocolate today, whatever that is. Anyway, she's a researcher. In the very first book, which is The Girl, the Dog and the Rider in Rome, she gets very unwell and she needs to go away for quite some time to recuperate. And so um, Freya is sent to live with a man she actually doesn't know. Um, Mum says he's a family friend. His name is Tobias and he is a writer. Um, Tobias is the most beautiful character and while that premise might seem unusual, um, Freya's life to date has been unusual. She's lived a very unusual life and actually I really just loved that there was this beautiful relationship between a young girl and her older guardian. It, it just is lovely. Tobias is um, a crime writer, he is bumbling, he is whimsical, he is heartwarming and he just wants to make Freya happy. And off they go to Rome um, in the first book. We never find out in the first book who Tobias actually is to Freya and her mother, whose name is Clementine. And then in the second book, they um, go off to Provence and it's equally as beautiful. The descriptions of um, the countryside in Provence and in Rome are just, you know, 
there's such a sense of setting in these books. The food is amazing. Oh my gosh, I've talked so much about food today. It's disgusting. Oh, all I've done is eat all day and now I'm talking about food. The food in these books is beautiful. Like it was one of my favorite things in the book. I've often had those experiences when you're reading a book where you then want to get up at midnight and cook whatever you've just been reading about. And I've certainly had that in these books with the pastries and the pasta and they're just, the food is wonderful. Um, look, they reminded me a little bit of, I'm going to admit now that I love Donna Leon crime novels, um, you know, which are full of food and family and, and not a lot of crime that's particularly scary. And these ones are a bit the same. They're just whimsical and wonderful and really beautiful. Excellent ones for tween readers who just want to escape into a better place. Um, you know, I, as I said, I'm launching the book Detention Tonight by Tristan Banks. Um, you know, this is an excellent book for middle grade readers. It, you know, it's full on and deals with some really big themes. You can probably guess what sort of themes. I'll talk about this one next Friday on Five on Friday. But, you know, sometimes you want to read this, which is really meaty and is going to stretch your brain. And sometimes you want to read The Girl, The Dog and The Rider in Rome and just escape into a better place where there is pastries and gelato in abundance. So that is my five books for today. I'm also going to show you a couple of books which have just arrived in the mail um, this week or last week and I haven't read them yet but I'm going to and I will talk about them over the next few Fridays. Definitely talking about this one next week. I'm not going to talk about it today because I want to um, launch it tonight and also find out what Tristan has to say about it. Um, I received yesterday this book which is a new Ando book of all things um, called Wolf Girl Into the Wild. Um, it's a bit more it's definitely a higher level than his last series but I'm really 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 keen to read it I haven't even looked at it yet this one is a new picture book called a goodbye house hello house and it is exquisite it's by Margaret Wilde and Anne James that so was always going to be great it is oh my gosh beautiful this is going to be the book I will be um recommending for a lot of little people in my life um, and I think that one's going to have some awards in its future. I will talk about that one when it's out and you can purchase it probably next week. Um, this arrived yesterday as well. It's another in the Puffin series that they've done where they've put together eight picture books into one nice big bind up. They're really great. Again, really giftable. And in this book, it's got some of my favorite picture books, including one that um, was Dan's favorite to read to Georgia, which was It's Bedtime William. He really loved reading that one to her. Then there's Pie in the Sky by Remy Lau. And Remy is going to be at Romancing the Stars tonight. <sighs> so when we have to speed date authors, I am actually really looking forward to talking to Remy and finding out about this book. I have heard only amazing things about this book. It's part graphic novel, um, part novel novel. It's quite large. Um, it's got really good themes apparently of um, grief and of um, diversity and of immigration. And I am so looking forward to reading. I've only heard good things about it. This one I am halfway through and absolutely loving. It's called As Happy As Here by Jane Godwin. Jane Godwin is without a doubt one of my favorite Australian authors. I like seriously have very big girl crush issues with her writing. I just adore everything she writes. Oliver Pomervan Don't Follow V is Ava's favourite book, My 11 Year Old, of the last little while. Um, she doesn't often read like the funny books, but uh, this one she just laughed and laughed and laughed and laughed in, which is, you know, a great thing. This one I wanted to read last week and I didn't get a chance to. This is Vincent and the Grandest Hotel on Earth by Lisa Nicholl. Her last book, um, Dr. Boogaloo, was one of my favourite books a few years ago, so I'm really, really keen to read this one. Maybe I'll, I'll try and read it this weekend. If I stop eating chocolate and all of the pastries in the world and feeling sick and like I have to go and have a little rest, I, I could fit a bit more reading in. And then there's Sick Bay, which is probably where I need to be now because I've eaten way too much. Honestly, I, I need to stop saying that, but I actually feel quite sick. I've eaten way too much today. Um, Sick Bait by Nova Wheatman. I love Nova Wheatman and I'm really looking forward to this one. Um, my 11 year old read this one last week and said it is the best book that she's read all year, which is high praise from her. Uh, she's, she's harsh. She is harsh as on books at book club this week. She just said, meh, didn't like the girl, the dog and the rider in Rome, which I discarded as did everybody else because the most, most of us really loved it. But she's harsh. She's really harsh. She either deeply loves a book or really doesn't like it. Um, so, yeah, 
that is my five on Friday for today. Hope you all have a great weekend. Uh, for those of you who are coming to the Gold Coast tonight for Romancing the Stars, um, be aware that I'm not feeling 100%. Probably don't get too close to me. I don't like hugs at the best of times anyway. So, you know, just feel free to keep your distance. Um, but I am super, super excited to be launching the Tristan Banks book. And I'm also driving down to the Gold Coast with one of my dearest teacher librarians friends, Trish Buckley. And Trish and I are not going to shut up for the entire drive down to the Gold Coast and back. Um, and then I've, yeah, got a oh, super busy weekend, but it'll all be good. Okay, have a great weekend yourselves. Bye.